to welcome all of you to our worship service here at Bethany today. Very glad to have you gathered around God's Word. We are continuing with that series theme entitled Victorious, and today we'll see how selfless love is victorious over self-glorification. Of course, we see that most clearly in the saving work that Jesus did for us, but we also see how that has application in our lives as His followers, as we seek to love others just as Jesus has loved us. So God's blessings as you consider that with me today. Uh, If you would please find the green guest cards located at either end of your pew. Give us a record of your visit with us today. You can drop those in the box provided, or if you prefer, use the QR code on the back of your service folder and you can check in that way. And then take just a moment to greet those who are worshiping nearby today. You may remain seated then as we begin this morning with a gathering right on the Word of God. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers. How sweet are your words to my taste. Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yet so often we have despised God's Word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask His forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus, 
who lived a perfect life for you, who died on the cross to pay for all your sins and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 22. Really a song of praise given by David because of the Lord's care and protection and all that the Lord enabled David to do. I chose this reading in part because of our confirmation coming up in our second service today to remind the kids that the Lord Jesus is our rock, the one that we can depend on always. But we also see in connection with our other readings today that it's our foundation on Jesus that allows us to show the kind of love to others that he asks us to in our everyday lives. Staying connected to him is the first part of being able to show love to others. So please listen. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock, my Savior. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. This is the word of our God. I invite our children here today to come forward for their message. Got one more coming. All right. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. So in that Bible reading we just had, one word that came up a bunch of times was rock. Okay? And when I heard that word rock a bunch of times, it made me think of a little game that maybe you guys know. Have you ever played rock, paper, scissors? You have? You know how that goes? You want to play one? Ready? One, two, three. Oh, so who won? You. I won, right? Because rock crushes scissors, right? So let's just go over the rules a minute. So rock crushes the scissors, right? Scissors cuts the paper, right? And paper covers the rock, okay? But you know what? I've always kind of thought that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, I, I understand how rock crushes scissors. 
right? And I understand how scissors cuts paper, but it seems like rock should be able to crunch the paper too, right? I mean, if you held the paper up and threw a rock at it, it'd put a hole right in it, right? So rock should not only crush the scissors, it should crush paper too. So I'm going to change the rules, and this time rock crushes scissors, rock crushes paper, but scissors still cuts paper, okay? So you want to play again? All right, ready? One, two, three. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Why do you keep using rock? Because that beats everything now, right? So that's what I want you guys to think about when you hear that word rock used about our God. It means that he's victorious over everything. And so we can always trust in him. If he's our rock, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried. We always know that we're going to be safe in his hands. So let's say a prayer, and we'll thank him for that, okay? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for giving us yourself and your son as our saving rock. We know that we can depend on you always. We know that you will keep us safe. We know that you are victorious over all our enemies, and you share that victory with us. You are our saving rock. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can go back to your seats. You're welcome. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. It takes place in the upper room. We'll hear that Judas had just left the room. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he gives them that one lesson that they must have remembered almost above all things from that evening, that simple command to love one another. In our sermon today, we'll dig into that word love a little deeper as we look at Paul's words regarding love in 1 Corinthians 13. But what we see here is that command that Jesus gives for his people to love others because he says that's the thing that's going to identify us as his people in this world. Since this is a record of our Savior's words, I invite you to please stand for our gospel reading. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. We'll join in confessing our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. <clears throat> we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll join in our next song. Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. It was the Thursday of Holy Week, the night before Jesus would go to the cross. He's gathered with his disciples in that upper room, celebrating the Passover with them. Three years of teaching were coming to an end. Three years of daily lessons from Jesus given both by word and example. Very soon Jesus would be returning to his Father in heaven. and Very soon the work that Jesus had given his disciples to do here on earth would begin in earnest. And yet on this last night together, Jesus' teaching continued. And it was needed. Even after all the time that they had spent with Jesus. And even on this very special night, 
Jesus' disciples still demonstrated that they had a lot to learn. Luke tells us in his Gospel that as they were gathered in the upper room that night, a dispute arose among the disciples about which of them was considered to be greatest. The night before Jesus goes to the cross. Self-glorification. That desire to be exalted above others and honored by others. Something that's common, of course, in the world. It's common in every human heart. And so it's common in the hearts of Jesus' followers as well. And so Jesus took this opportunity to teach his disciples and us one more lesson. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A new command? Well, not exactly. I mean, it had always been God's will that His people should love Him above all things and love others as they love themselves. But on the very next day, Jesus' disciples would see this love demonstrated in a new and ultimate way as He gave up His life for them and for all. The disciples would see selfless love nailed to the cross. Three days later, they would see selfless love victorious over the self-glorification that infects our hearts and all hearts. Jesus' Easter victory gives us a new perspective on this new command. As I have loved you, Jesus says, love one another. And so this morning we turn to these verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great love chapter. And the Apostle Paul shows us here why selfless love is always the more excellent way than self-glorification. And he begins by showing us just how absolutely necessary love is in our Christian life. Without love, he says, our best words and our best actions would all be worthless and empty. Listen to how Paul starts. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The Christians in Corinth struggled with spiritual pride, with this desire for self-glorification. And that one gift of speaking in tongues was one that was especially coveted by the people in Corinth. They thought that it would show them to be kind of a superior Christian over against others. But Paul tells them here, even if somebody could speak in the tongues of angels, if they didn't have love, they'd be no better than a noisy gong or cymbal. The gifts of prophecy, spiritual knowledge, and great faith are far more valuable for the mission of the church than speaking in tongues ever was. But here again, Paul says, even if somebody had all of these gifts in abundance, but had no love, they'd be nothing. We could give everything we possess to the poor. We could sacrifice ourselves entirely for the cause. And yet without love, we gain nothing by doing so. Our gifts, whatever they were, would be no more valuable than the one offered by Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that story? 
In Acts chapter 5, we're introduced to this couple. We're told that they sold a piece of their property, and then they brought a generous gift and laid it at the feet of the apostles to be put to use for the ministry and to help the poor. But in their desire for recognition, they lied about just how generous that gift was. Self-glorification, rather than selfless love, was the driving factor behind that gift. And so God wasn't pleased. Love is the only motivation acceptable to God. God, first and foremost, looks at people's hearts. And when hearts are not warmed by His love and moved by His love, that they, then they can't produce things that are pleasing to Him. Two people could do the exact same thing and yet only one of those things would be pleasing to God if one heart was moved by love and the other was moved by something else. The story of Cain and Abel is a prime example. Both of them brought their offerings and presented them to God. And yet Cain had no love in his heart. And so God did not accept his gift. It's a reminder for us to ask ourselves that simple question sometimes. Why am I doing this? Why am I gathered for worship today? Why did I bring a gift along with me today? Why am I serving on this committee or team? Why did I volunteer for this task? Why am I helping this person? Is it for the glory of God and the good of others? Selfless love? Or is it for me? Self-glorification. After Paul makes clear just how necessary love is for our Christian life, he goes on to show us what this selfless love really looks like. Listen as I continue. He writes, Love is patient. Love is kind. <clears throat> it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Paul's words about love here are pretty straightforward, clear. They're not so difficult to understand, but of course, to put them into practice, we know that's a different story. You notice that as Paul talks about this subject, he never describes love as this kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that we get on the inside. Instead, he speaks about love in terms of actions, actions that are always considering what's good and right. For the other person. And so when God teaches us about love, He's not telling us how we should expect to feel. He's telling us how He expects us to treat one another. Selfless love is seen in the simple, everyday things of life. Selfless love is seen in the simple interactions that we have in our daily relationships with one another. But you know, none of us here can listen to these words about love, can read through this section without immediately recognizing our failures in this area. We haven't always been kind or patient. There are times when we're rude and self-seeking. Times when we're happy to bring up the wrongs that others have done in the past. Times when we're guilty of delighting in evil rather than rejoicing in the truth. Paul's words here are a clear, straightforward indictment of our lack of love. And that's a serious problem. It's not a problem that we can just sort of pretend doesn't exist, and it's not a problem that we could ever fix on our own. But God has provided the solution for us even more so than the words that we just read. 
God shows us what true love really is in the person of His Son. In Jesus, we see perfect, selfless love toward God and towards others all the time. In Jesus, we see the One who loved us enough to take all of our sins, our lack of love, our lack of kindness, our selfishness, our impatience, our anger, and everything else, and endure the punishment that we deserve for all of it. Jesus is the one who laid down his life for us. Selfless love. And through faith in him, we gain everything that he accomplished by that love. Forgiveness of sins. A new spiritual life and a brand new heart. And of course, the promise of eternal life as well. God says it like this in 1 John chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. That's perfect, selfless love. It's an action. Undeserved. Totally committed on Jesus' part. Self-sacrificing. Jesus did it all perfectly. And it was all directed toward us. Even though, of course, He's worthy of all honor, all glory. He laid all of that aside for a time for our sake. And even though in our worship we give Him all honor and glory, that's not the reason why He did it. It wasn't for self-glorification. Rather, it was for selfless love. Love for you and me. That helps us to better understand Jesus' encouragement in the upper room that night. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So Paul shows us what selfless love really is. He tells us how necessary it is for our life of faith. And now as he wraps up this section, he reminds us that love truly is the greatest thing of all. He says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Prophecy, the gift of tongues, spiritual knowledge, these are all good gifts from God to His church. And yet, they only last as long as this world lasts. And some of them, not even that long. The gift of prophecy and the gift of speaking in tongues and the need that that served seemed to be very short-lived in the early church. Once the Scriptures were written down and widely disseminated, once the church was planted and began to grow, then the guidance and direction of new prophecy the confirmation that the gift of tongues brought to the gospel message, those things were no longer necessary. Spiritual knowledge, of course, is something we still need, something we'll never have enough of in this life. But even here, the pursuit of this is one day going to pass away. Because Paul says, once in heaven, then we are going to fully know what now we struggle to comprehend and understand. And so he says, what remains is faith, hope, And love, but the greatest of these is love. And of course, many wonder why is it that love should rise above even things like faith and hope? Well, one Lutheran pastor gave this explanation. He said, God has not called faith or hope directly, He has called love. And so to possess and display Christian love is to be most like God. What could be greater than that? And it's not a bad thought. 
But in keeping with the rest of what Paul says in this section, it seems that the reason why love rises even above faith and hope is because just like those other things that we mentioned, the day will come when faith and hope will cease to exist. Right now, as we go about our lives in this world, like Abraham, we live by faith, not by sight. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But once we get to heaven, that faith turns to sight. Because we'll see him as he is. We'll see Jesus face to face. Right now we have the sure hope of heaven. It's as certain as the word of God itself. But in his letter to the Romans, Paul asks the question, who hopes for what they already have? And what he means to say is this, that although our hope of heaven is sure, the truth is, we're still waiting for it. But once we get there, hope turns to realization, to perfect fulfillment and ultimate enjoyment. And yet love remains. Jesus' victory of selfless love over all self-glorification, well, that will be ours to share in and enjoy for all eternity. A little later this morning, 11 of our young people here at Bethany are going to speak their confirmation promises before God. The same promises that so many of us spoke at one time or another ourselves. And so I want to go back just a moment to the encouragement that Jesus gave his disciples in the upper room that evening. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's hard to imagine a better encouragement to give to those young confirmants. And the truth is, it's an encouragement that all of us need as God's people. I mean, to carry out this new command that Jesus gives is really nothing more than to keep the promises that we each made at our confirmation. Love one another, Jesus says. In order to love others, we have to always stay connected to Jesus' love. That's our life, our strength, our motivation, our rock, as we said before. It's one of the chief promises we make at our confirmation. And I know it's cliche, but it's true. Confirmation is not graduation from our time spent in God's Word. We have to be here. Hearing the Word. Receiving the sacrament. Making faithful use of the means of grace through which the Holy Spirit promises to strengthen our faith and increase our love. Love one another. In order to carry that out, we have to be with one another. And so we have to continue to gather with our fellow believers to worship, to study, to enjoy fellowship. We have to seek to build relationships with those who are not believers so that we can share Jesus' love with them as well. Confirmation promises that we made are exactly in line with the encouragement that Jesus gives here. Love one another. I know it's not exactly a new command, but every day is a new opportunity for us to be assured of Jesus' perfect love. And every day there will be new opportunities for us to show and to share that love with others. And of all the things that we might do over the course of our lives in this world, there's nothing greater than that. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by gathering our offering. We will continue with our prayers. I invite you to join your hearts with mine. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and sacraments. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church. Great God and Father, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith 
lose courage and grow careless in our watchfulness. Give us the strength to face each day with new confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. And remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering. Bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, we ask for your care, blessings, and protection for the 11 young people here at Bethany who will make their confirmation promises later this morning. May the good work you began in them at their baptisms be carried to completion on the day you return in your glory. According to your promise, never leave them or forsake them, but guide them with your word of grace and truth and guard them as your dearly loved children. Finally, Lord, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we also pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
never fails you When my heart won't make a sound I can't turn back around When the sky is falling down Nothing is greater than this Greater than this Cause love is right here Love is alive Love is Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that You have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it You will strengthen our faith in You and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We'll join together in our closing hymn.